So you can see me. Hello, Facebook. Uh, yeah, I waited my camera to flip there so my Periscope folks can see me. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody's doing well. Prophet David Taylor here with your weekly live prophetic word. There we go. Hello, Periscope. With your weekly live prophetic word. So let's start out with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, O God, humble and, and bow down before you, O God, as humble as we know how. Uh, for you are not a God that has pleasure in wickedness or pride, O God. So we ask you to forgive us for any level of pride we have walked in, O God. And instead, O God, cleanse us and teach us humility that we might have the right attitude before you, God, at all times. Fill us with your precious Holy Spirit, O God. Uh, use me during this broadcast, O God, to let what comes out of my mouth be what you want said, that you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified and that the demons might be terrified. And let it make the difference. You said your word will not return until you void, O oh God. So let it make the difference that you have purpose for it to make so that we might hear your voice and line up all the more with you. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We count it a blessing and an honor that you saved us and opened our eyes to you. And we want to give you the glory in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, look like Facebook is acting funny. I don't know what's up with my connection today, but we're just going to go with what we've got. Okay, so as usual, I'm going to give you a lot of information today, so you're going to have to watch this video more than once to get all the information that's coming forward today. What's my tagline? My tagline is, God already told you what was going to happen if you would just listen to his servants, the prophets. Okay, God already told you what was coming. God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets, okay? So again, I want to say welcome to all my audiences, uh, my Facebook Live audience, my Periscope audience, and those of you that are watching the replay, and those of you that are watching on YouTube, okay? I want you to please like and share this video. Uh, whenever a prophetic word is released, it's designed to change, change families, change cities, change regions, change nations, change the world. So please like and share this video and get it out to as many people as you can. If you want to sow it to my ministry, if you're receiving anything from it, uh, Matthew 10, 41, whosoever receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. PayPal.me link on Facebook and Periscope and my Twitter feed. And my, I have an Amazon Smile link where you can donate to my not-for-profit, Prophet David Taylor organization. Okay? How, you found, how, you, how to find me is always hashtag everything I do with hashtag PDT. So whenever you look up Prophet David Taylor, please uh, include the hashtag PDT. That's how you'll find me in anything that I, any content that I have released. Okay? Uh, I am live on Facebook now, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook and Periscope every Sunday. And then on the second Thursday of every month, second Thursday, I do a broadcast called No More Genies, where we, we deal with our genie concept of God where all the things that we believe about God that have been magic or unreal or not of faith, we get rid of those and we replace those with real faith. Okay? All right. And you can watch that replay on Facebook, Periscope, or YouTube as well. Okay? All right. So now we're going to get into our topic for today. The prophetic word for today is come out. Come out. That's the prophetic word for today is come out. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's look at our scripture reference. A scripture reference is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. And I'm reading out of the NIV. Okay, 2 Corinthians, uh, as you may or may, 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 may not know, is one of the epistles of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. Okay. And most of, most of the explanatory texts in terms of the doctrine of the New Testament was written by Apostle Paul, okay? Um, because up until Jesus died, they were going off of the Mosaic Law or the Mosaic Covenant. Um, the first five books of the Bible are called by us Gentiles, the Pentateuch, and they're called by the Hebrews, the Jewish people, the Torah. And the laws that Moses gave them was pretty much what they were living by until Jesus came. 
when Jesus died and shed his blood, then the New Testament of God and Christ kicked in. And so the section of the Bible that we call the New Testament spends most of its time explaining itself. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is about the life of Christ that was recorded. Acts is about the birth of the church and the first evangelism from the birth of the church. And then uh, 1 and 2 Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John um, is more about Christian living. Jude and James are heavier into Christian living, but Jude gets into the prophetic, and the book of Revelation is about the end time and the end of the world and the beginning of eternity. But every book between Acts and 1 Peter is uh, the New Testament basically explaining itself, explaining that this is what the New Testament means, this is what it looks like, this is what we're supposed to do now, this is what God is saying to us with this new covenant. And most of that was written by the Apostle Paul. I don't say all of it because there's some dispute about the book of, Hebrew, book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was basically written to Jewish Christians. Some believe Paul wrote it. Some believe Luke wrote it. Some believe Apollos wrote it. Okay? But the stuff we know for sure Paul did write. Uh, and he was writing many times letters to churches to answer their questions. That's why you have a book called Ephesians. It was written to the church at Ephesus. That's why we're reading out of Corinthians. It was written to the church at Corinth. Follow that? That's why you have Thess uh, Thessalonians. It was written to the church at Thessalonica. See what I mean? Those are letters that Apostle Paul wrote to explain how we would relate to God now under the New Testament. So given that background, let's read our scripture. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, excuse me, 2 Corinthians. of fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Whoa, Lord, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, you know, probably not going to have time during this session to unpack all of that, but I want to focus on what the Lord said to focus on. And again, the prophetic word today was come out. have any business dating someone that's not a believer in Christ. Okay, let me say that again. Generally speaking, if you are a believer and you're looking for someone to date or marry, you don't have any business dating or marrying someone that is not in Christ. Okay? Generally speaking, like I said, there's definitely situations where both people are unsaved and then they get married and then one of them gets saved after the marriage. Now you're married to someone that's not saved. And the Bible tells you how to deal with that. I don't have time to exegete all that. But the Bible does tell you what to do if you have, if you're saved and you're married to someone that isn't. But I'm talking about uh, if you're single and you're looking for someone to marry, should you date unbelievers? And that answer is no. Should you marry 
if you're a Christian, people that are non-Christians, that answer is no. No, you shouldn't. Many times people do, but we shouldn't. Why? Because it says, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? Your values and your, your operational systems and what you want to do with your life are going to be in direct conflict with somebody that's not saved. I'll just give you a few quick examples. For example, your finances. When God gives us finances, he calls us to tithes, offerings, and alms. Tithes are when you give 10% tithes or when you give 10% off of the money you make. Offerings is when you give something additional to, okay, premium, uh, please pray for me. Pray for what? Uh, premium, tell me specifically what you need prayer for so I can pray for that. Offerings are when you give something additional above the 10%. And alms are when you do services to the poor. So when you're reaching out to poor people or homeless people or, or people that are just uh, in unfortunate circumstances, when you help them out financially or with food or with clothes or with sick visitations or with visitations to prison, those are alms. Okay? So God calls us to healing of my digestive system, all right? Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to Prima's digestive system and I command the healing power of Jesus Christ to flow. I command everything in her digestive system. Prima, put your hand on your stomach. I command everything in her digestive system to be 100% whole from her esophagus, her trachea, her abdomen, her intestines, her stomach. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I command wholeness that her food might digest and that she might get the nutrition that she needs and have no more problems from this day forward. In Jesus' name we declare it, amen. Amen and amen. Premier, believe it. Do it like I told you. Put your hand on your stomach and you'll feel the power of God flow through and heal you. Okay? So, so uh, tithes, offerings, and alms. If you're married to somebody that's not saved, you're not going to see eye to eye on what to do with your money. Another example is fasting. What if the Holy Spirit says you need to fast? If the Lord calls you to fast and you're married to somebody that doesn't believe in that, then they're not going to join you, you know, with that. Um, another really huge one that people go through is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord comes from getting to know Christ. It comes from spending time with the Lord. It comes from watching God answer your prayer. It comes from being in his presence, okay? Because it's a relationship, it's not a religion. And if you're married to somebody that has no relationship with Christ, then you, you, there's a huge part of your life you're not going to be able to share with your spouse, Okay? So let me say this. We have to stop looking at God's commandments as if they are punitive or designed to make you not enjoy your life. That is the lie that the devil told Eve in the garden, and she bought it. The devil told Eve that God was somehow trying to hold her back, that God knew that if she ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she would become as God, and she would get a glow up, as they say now, because somehow all that God had given her wasn't enough, and that God was trying to hold something back from her, and that wasn't true. And that's the lie that the devil tells to people to keep them away from God, that somehow a life with God is going to be less than the life you have now, that somehow a life with God is going to be a step down. That's not true. So when God says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers, that's designed to protect you. If you save, you're going to struggle if you're dating or married to somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus. Because there are going to be things that you know, things you see in the Spirit, things you see coming prophetically, and things that you hear the Lord tell you to do that they're just not going to be down with. That's a lifetime worth of struggle. And marriage is hard enough as it is already than trying to add more struggle to the mix. Okay? So stop reading this commandment of do not be yoked together with unbelievers like God is trying to hold you back from something. God is trying, if you want a relationship, God is trying to get you in a relationship where y'all have Jesus in common. Then you can share your relationship with the Lord. You can help each other grow in Christ. You can pray for each other. You can fast together. Everything changes when you are with a believer. Now, I must also throw in there, not all believers are at the same level. That can make a difference too. But at least if somebody's saved, that means their spirit is born again, recreated, and they can be filled with the Holy Ghost and they can cast out demons, and there's so much that you can do when you're born again, because you're a part of God's family. But when you're not saved, you don't have access to any of that. You don't have access to the Holy Ghost, you don't have access to the prophetic, you don't have access to any of the advantages that we have as Christians when you are not saved. 
So stop reading this commandment like it's a punishment. What we do is we pit people in the flesh and not in the spirit. We get all hot and bothered over them. We get all excited and we want to have sex with them or we start having sex with them or we get this idea about being married. We get these wrong ideas in our head and then once you start getting physically involved with people, you're not going to want to let them go. And that blinds you to who they are. God knows that. So he's trying to make it to where you don't get caught up with someone and you don't really know who they are. That's what he means, don't be uh, yoked together with unbelievers, because they are most likely going to drag your life down. There's enough challenges and struggles in marriage as it is right now without you adding the extra challenge of you save and you trying to love the Lord and live for Christ and you're married to somebody that don't bit more know the Lord than my left shoe. That's going to be a rough life. And a lot of people have found that out the hard way because God told you not to marry that person and you jumped out there and married them anyway. Now you come to church by yourself because you don't have Christ in common. See what I mean? I could do a whole hour on that, okay? But also, let's look at verse 15. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Uh, now, that part talks about there's a broader context than just getting married. It's saying here, what fellowship can light have with darkness? Okay? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? See, unbelievers operate by a different spirit. There's a different spirit in them that's in you. Okay? So now, obviously, we have to deal with people that are not of the faith because the world is not full of just Christians. And, you know, we got to buy toothpaste. We got to buy food. We got to go to work. We have to do a whole bunch of things. So obviously it's not talking about us just completely disconnected from the world around us because Jesus himself didn't do that. It's talking about close relationships, intimate relationships, fellowship, hanging out, breaking bread, uh, 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 trying to mix your lifestyles, trying to mix a saved lifestyle with an unsaved lifestyle. It's never going to happen and it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Okay, it says, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Let me give you some practical examples. When you wake up in the morning as a believer, what you're supposed to do is start your day with time with God. Time in the written word, and then time listening to some preached word, watch a video, and then time in prayer with God in his presence. You talk to him, and you let him talk to you. And the more you tune your mind with the word of God, the more you begin to hear the Holy Spirit and his gentle leading on the inside of you. That's normal for us. That's how we're supposed to start our day. And when you start your day by putting God first, God blesses the entire rest of the day. I kid you not. That is literally the truth. When you honor God with the first fruits of your day, when you get up in the morning, you spend time with him, he literally blesses the rest of your day. You'll have more energy. You'll get more stuff done favor, doors open. It's the most amazing thing. <clears throat> and sometimes God even blesses you with time. What do I mean by that? It, I mean that you might be surprised that you get more done in a day than you thought you could do because God extended the time and let you get more done. It's the most amazing thing. It's stuff that only God can do. So that's why I'm always talking about the benefits of being a Christian. Because the more you get to know Christ, why would you not want to be saved? Why would you not want to be loved? Why would you not want to have your sins forgiven? Why would you not want to walk in the prophetic where God can tell you what's going to happen before it happens? Why would you not want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Why would you not want that? You see what I mean? But somebody that's unsaved, that's not how they start their day. They get up and they go about their business. They don't acknowledge God. They don't honor God. They don't pray to God. And see, when you don't uh, ask God to preside over your day, when you don't let him be the Lord of your life, and when you don't armor up, you are literally going out there against the devil uncovered. That's why so many people get taken out like that. Because if you don't ask God to cover you every day, and I mean day by day, if you don't ask God to cover you every day, you're going out there against the devil unarmored. You have no defense against the devil but the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We can't stand against the devil on our own. You have to stand against the devil in Jesus' name. And you have to plead the blood of Jesus and you have to do 
like Jesus did in the wilderness in Matthew 4, say, it is written. Use the sword of the Spirit. You see that? But when you're not saved, you don't even know what I'm talking about. When you're not saved, everything that comes along with a saved lifestyle sounds crazy to you. You're not going to be able to mix those lifestyles. That's what it's talking about. Okay? We move on to verse 16. It says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. See, now God just took it to a whole nother level. God says that our bodies are physically his temple and he lives with us and walks among us, walks among us and he's our God and we're his people. The spirit of God lives on the inside of us. That means we have to be careful what we do with our bodies. Unsaved people don't live that way. Unsaved, unsaved people do all kinds of carnal things with their bodies. We're not supposed to do that. My pastor was just talking about that this morning, about uh, some of the things that people do. And we're not supposed to do that as Christians because the Spirit of God is in us. We are actually His temple. He wants to walk with us, live with us, breathe with us. Okay? Verse 17, Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now again, let me add the balance. Because you have to deal with people in this world. And everybody you deal with is not going to be saved. So it doesn't mean, oh, you ain't saved. You know, I'm not going to deal with you. I can't talk to you, blah, 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 because that's not going to happen. You can't have that life when you're just around Christians. Okay? Well, that's talking about when it says come out and be separate. It means you don't have a worldly lifestyle. That's what that means. My pastor talked about that, too, about how now there are some Christians who on New Year's Eve are going out and getting drunk. Okay, you're not supposed to be getting lit on, excuse me, New Year's Eve. You're not supposed to be getting lit on New Year's Eve. That's what the world does. That's not what we do. If we do anything on New Year's Eve, we should be coming to the house of God, ringing in the new year with thanksgiving and praises. Or if you don't come to, a, you know, an all-night watch service, then thank God in your home or get together with some other believers or whatever. But we don't, go, we don't go out and party and get lit to ring in a new year. That's worldly. That's not what we do. You see what I mean? Uh, so it's talking about separate lifestyles. I already talked to you about the money. Every time you get a dollar in your hand, where's my wallet? Every time you get a dollar in your hand, okay? Every time you get a dollar in your hand, do you know what you're supposed to do? You sp do you know what you're supposed to do with every dollar you get? You're supposed to, supposed to take a dime out of that dollar right off the top. So every dollar that God blesses you with, you owe him a minimum of a dime. That's 10%. That's the tithe, okay? A minimum of a dime. And then you add on top of that your offering, and then if you do alms to help poor people. That's what we do with our money. Every dollar. There's supposed to be no dollar. Okay, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to Erica's son. I command his lungs to open. I rebuke the spirit of asthma. In Jesus' name, I command his lungs and his breathing, his areoli, uh, everything inside him, oh God, everything, everything inside those lungs to open. Let the air come in, oh God. Uh, we rebuke the spirit of asthma. We curse it from the root and command it to dry up. And he's every whit whole. We thank you for it. We believe you for it right now in Jesus' name. Now, Erica, I have been through that because my son had asthma. And I laid hands on him and I rebuked the spirit of asthma. And then he got healed and he stopped using his inhaler. Okay? So believe, believe, because if God did it for me, he'll do it for you. No problem. If God did it for me, he'll do it for you, because God's no respecter of person. Okay? And if that asthma ever looks like it's trying to come back, put your hand on your son's chest and rebuke it and command his lungs to open. Okay? Because that's what I did. Okay? My boy's grown, hasn't used an inhaler in years, because we rebuked the spirit of asthma when he was little. Okay? All right. So, as I said, <clears throat> this is what we're supposed to do with our money. That is the proper lifestyle for us as believers, okay? But someone that doesn't know God, they're not going to pay tithes. They're not going to give offerings. You see what I mean? That doesn't even make any sense to them. So what God is saying is, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. We're not supposed to be mixing lifestyles with worldly people. One more time. We're not supposed to be missing 
mixing lifestyles with worldly people. We're supposed to live according to the word of God and according to the will of God. And I'll say people don't do that. Okay? For example, I'll give you an example uh, out of my personal life. My uh, Twitter followers on my comic Twitter, they know I don't use profanity. I tweet all the time, you know, talking about superhero movies and the Flash or a bunch of stuff, but I don't curse. They know I don't curse. They know I don't use profanity. That's not on my timeline, okay? Because they know I'm a believer. You see what I mean? They know I'm a person of faith. They know that I'm a follower of Christ. I don't, you know, spend a lot of time preaching on that particular Twitter. I have my prophet Twitter, but they know that I don't use profanity. See that? Because I'm supposed to be living a Christian lifestyle. And we live Christian lifestyles by the grace of God, according to the word of God. So that's what I mean when I say the Lord is, is saying that it's time for us to come out, <laughs> to come out from anything that has us mixing with an unsaved lifestyle. But here's why. Most of the time, or many times, at least in my experience, when people talk about stuff like this, they fuss at you. They give you fussology, not theology. They give you fussology. They fuss and fuss, and you're supposed to be saved and all this finger wagging and blah, 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 about how you're supposed to be. I stopped by to tell you this is a love commandment. Do you know why? Because the wages of sin is death. If God is calling you away from a sinful lifestyle, it's because that lifestyle would produce death. Examples. Cigarettes. Don't nobody start smoking at 40. <laughs> if you smoked, you started smoking when you was 11, 12, 13 years old because you thought it was the coolest thing ever. If you live to see 40, your lungs are going to be so messed up. You might be one of those people on TV taking your jar out or you might have the little, little dial put in your throat in your trachea because you messed up everything up here because it's covered with carcinogens and cancer. And, and I've seen autopsies where, autopsies where when they cut the body open of a smoker, their lungs are like charcoal and you, they have to cut them with scissors. If God is calling you out of smoking, it's because smoking is producing death. We need to stop talking about our Christian lifestyle as if it's a punishment. Jesus never talked that way. The Lord never talked like following the will of the Father was a punishment or a chore. He never talked that way. And we need to stop talking that way as believers. Okay? Uh, liquor. You might, like, you might like liquor. A lot of people like liquor. If you stay with alcohol, alcohol will eventually rot your guts. Alcohol will eventually run your, run your blood pressure up because you can't really drink liquor when you have hypertension. Because it increases your hypertension, your high blood pressure. And alcohol is addictive. And if you've ever dealt with alcohol, or you have alcohol in your family or in your bloodline, or you know someone that struggled with alcohol, dealing, dealing with alcohol is a roller coaster, if you didn't know that. Any type of substance abuse, that person in your life is going to take you up and down, up and down, up and down for years. It's awful. When you're in a relationship with someone that's a substance abuser, there's three people in the relationship, you, them, and the substance. And it's going to be like this. It's going to be, and it's going to wear you out. It's going to wear you out. Right. Drinking could be a generational curse. That's right. It's going to wear you out. So when God is telling us, we're not supposed to be getting lit. Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine where in his excess, but be filled with the spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So in other words, the Lord is saying, we got the Holy Ghost to fill us up. We got the Holy Ghost to give us joy. We, we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God and maintain the joy of the Lord. We don't need to get lit to have joy in life. Do you see what I mean? Um, same thing is true as relationships. And I deal with this more like on my, no, my say my marriage part of my No More Genies thing, but... One of the things that happens is when you get uh, sexually or physically involved with people, it blinds you to who they are. So one of the reasons God tells us to live holy when we're single is because he doesn't want us to get blinded and get caught up in a relationship. Because when you get physical with someone, it starts the bonding process. Because sex is designed to take two and make them one. Again, sex is designed to take two and make them one. So when you get involved physically with somebody, you just lose sight of who they are because it feels so good to be physically intimate with them. 
And then you're going to end up getting married, and then guess what happens? Who they really are comes out later. And who they really are was always there all the time, but we got over into fornication or adultery, or like if you're one of those people that's always in love with somebody married, like you're not happy <laughs> unless you're going after somebody that's married, all that. The reason God tells us to stop doing that is because God knows that behavior will, first of all, bring a lot of shame on your name and mess your life up. It doesn't glorify God. But also, thirdly, it produces death. I'm here to tell you there are some people that are growing old by themselves right now because of their relationship sins. They got involved with a married person when they were young and kept dating married people. And if you go into somebody's life with the purpose of taking their husband or their wife, Somebody going to come in your life and take your husband and your wife. Count on it. Count on it. You can't go over there seducing married people and get in relationships with them and think there's not going to be an answer in your life. Because there will be. And you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it when the bill comes. So what the devil does is he entices us with the pleasure of sin. And he doesn't uh, mention to you the bill. It's like, you know, running up stuff on your credit card. Feels good to just charge it, don't it? Till that bill come, now you got to pay. Okay? And so when God calls us, calls us out of fornication and adultery, God doesn't want us to be making babies all over creation. God doesn't want us to be getting involved with people that aren't right for us. God doesn't want us to receive or give STDs. God doesn't want us to mess our lives and our reputation up. So that's what I mean when I say when the Lord says come out, and live a saved lifestyle, I stop by to tell you that's not a punishment. <laughs> that's not a punishment. When, when the Holy Spirit begins to convict you about your diet, let's say you're struggling with your diet because, you know, yeah, I live in America. I know some of you are watching me from other parts of the world, but over here in America, um, there's no food that can be had that we don't have. <laughs> okay, so if you love food in America, you in the right country. <laughs> Because there's no food on earth that can be made that's not here somewhere. But if the Spirit of, God, Spirit of God begins to deal with you on your diet, many times we will fight that, we will resist that, we'll do a whole bunch of things. What the Holy Ghost is trying to do is to get you to eat a, a better diet to help your body last longer, to help you live longer, to help you stay healthy. You see what I mean? It's not a punishment, but it's that flesh nature, that flesh nature that's against God. That's always fighting. The Bible talks about that, that the flesh wars against the soul. So in other words, that cursed flesh nature that we got from Adam and Eve is always fighting God. And that's why God tells us we must crucify it. We can't listen. We have to kill it so that we can listen to what God says, because God's ways are the ways of life. It's just that you have to take up your cross to walk in God's ways. You have to fight the devil to walk in God's ways. You have to crucify your flesh. To walk in God's ways. You have to not be your own Lord. And let Jesus be your Lord. To walk in God's ways. That's the struggle. But God's actual commandment is a blessing. So that's what I mean when I say. Whatever your religious background. If you have any religious background. You quite possibly. Have heard this scripture. In the context of. Somebody just fussing at you. Well you're supposed to live saved. You're supposed to be saved. But just like everything with God. It is a love commandment. It is God saying if you come out from a worldly lifestyle and he says touch no, un no unclean thing and I will receive you because if you are dealing with unclean things they're going to destroy you man they're going to destroy you uh, pornography. So I was watching this special, this is a long time ago special when they still had on I think I don't think it was Scared Straight they used to have something on TV called Scared Straight where they would interview people in prison I don't think that's what I think it was like a nightline or something. Anyway there was this dude who was on there, and the first thing out of his mouth was, he said, how did I get here? He said he started watching porn as a teenager because everybody does it, and the next thing he knew, he got into harder core stuff and harder and harder core stuff, and then he went all the way to child porn, and then he got busted by the FBI, and he said, how did that happen? Because he had no intention of going that far. But one of my pastors, uh, when I was younger, taught me this principle, and here it is. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you 
more than you want to pay. Okay, let me say that again. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you more than you want to pay. So when God tells us to not touch unclean things, that's a blessing to us. That's not a punishment. Because the Lord knows when you get involved in unclean things, they destroy your life. If you are struggling, let's say, with drugs, and there's all kinds of drugs. I mean, there, there's like street drugs, there's hardcore drugs, there's what they call poor people drugs, and then there's what they call rich people drugs. But any substance that has control over your life, okay? In the Greek, that word is pharmakos. That word translated in English is sorcery. So when you see the word sorcery in the Bible, look up the Greek word. Many times that translation is pharmakos. It's where we get pharmaceutical from. It means mixing potions that control you. Okay? So drugs, somebody brought you drugs. Drugs are not natural in the sense of, you know, getting high and getting out of your mind, getting tore up. The first time you did drugs, somebody brought you that. Somebody offered you some pills. Somebody offered you to do a line of coke. Somebody shot something in your arm. Somebody offered you something, and then you got addicted. And there's some drugs out there that are so addictive, you get addicted like one time. Like crystal meth. Crystal meth is so terrible until in three to six months, you won't even look human anymore. I'm serious. Just, just look at pe uh, pictures of people <clears throat> that are on crystal meth. Look at the before and after. It will take less than six months for crystal meth to begin to be to destroy your body, destroy your looks, destroy your health, and you only have to do crystal meth one time and you'll get addicted. That's an unclean thing. So when the Lord says, touch no unclean thing, when the Lord says to you, don't do drugs, that's a blessing to you. See what I mean? Because if you put them substances in your body, they're going to take over your body, they're going to take over your mind, they're going to destroy your health. They're going to destroy your youth. They're going to take all your money. They're going to destroy your reputation, and you won't care. You'll do anything to turn what you do into cash and turn cash into drugs. And see, uh, my pastor talked about it this morning. He said the way to, to, to walk in life is with a spirit of humility. And I say that to say this. None of us is above anything. We have to stay close to the Lord. We cannot defeat these things on our own. And everybody has that sin that you like. And anybody that tells you different is lying. Everybody has that sin that you like. It's not the same for everybody, but everybody got one. <coughs> I don't care if it's liquor. I don't care if it's cursing. I don't care if it's idolatry. I don't care if it's pornography. I don't care if it's adultery. I don't care if it's violence. I don't care if it's racism. I don't care what it is. Everybody has that sin that you like. Whereas the Bible says the sin is, does so easily beset us. The only way to live the way the Lord wants you to live is to humble yourself and ask him for the grace. Please, Jesus, give me grace to not touch unclean things. Please, G Jesus, give me grace to come out from a worldly lifestyle. Because not only does that glorify God, but that's what's best for you. And I bet some of y'all listen to me. I bet nobody ever told you that in your whole life. I bet you they just fussed at you. They made you feel bad because you wasn't saved enough. Because <laughs> you wasn't living saved enough. Because you had one foot in the world or one foot in the church. Or you were just struggling. Because anybody, tell, anybody that tells you that they instantly overcome everything in their life when you get saved, that's a lie. Some stuff when you get saved, you get delivered from on the spot. Some stuff, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you get delivered on the spot. But some stuff, you got to grow out of. Okay? Some stuff, you got to grow out of. Sometimes, even when you get deliverance, you can cast a demon out. But now, you have to rebuild a life without that thing in it. See what I mean? So, I'm saying that you may have heard this preached in the context of making you feel bad, making you feel not saved enough making you feel like you weren't saved at all, or making you feel like you weren't a Christian just because you're struggling. That's not true. When the word says, come out from among them and be separate, touch no unclean thing, it's talking to Christians. Why would Paul have to say that if we didn't have to consciously make the choice? 
So I stopped by to tell you that I'm not here to put you under condemnation. I'm here to let you know that when God is calling you to come out of something, it's in your best interest. If you are dating someone and the Holy Ghost says that's not the one for you, break up with them today. But you say, Prophet Taylor, that's going to be painful. It really will be. It's going to hurt really bad, especially if you're having sex with them, which you shouldn't be doing. If you're having sex with them, you took two and you made them one, and now you're bound with them. If God told you that person is not the one, break up with them today. Because you know what's going to happen? Your life will never become what it was supposed to be if you stay with the wrong relationship. And it might not be something that you personally see until 20 years down the road. Like, you might date somebody in 19 to 20, you might be 40 years old before you realize, I shouldn't have been bothered with them. And your life might be all the way off track. If God is telling you to change your diet, that once again, I'm always uh, telling you about stuff that I'm doing. I'm not just talking at you. I just went to the health food store and got me a whole bunch of salads and a whole bunch of fruit and just got a whole bunch of more organic stuff in my refrigerator because you know how easy it is to fall back into um, unclean eating when you're busy. But I just went and got a refrigerator full of some healthy food. I've been munching on uh, salads. I got a salad on the counter right now, some fresh fruit, you know, because I'm trying to listen to the Holy Spirit about the things I'm putting in my body. Okay, so once again, I'm not talking to you about anything that I'm not doing or dealing with myself. Because you know how some people, they talk at you. <laughs> I'm talking with you, brother to brother, brother to sister in Christ. And so when God tells us to leave stuff alone or to move away from that, it's in our best interest. If God convicts you about pornography, God says stop watching porn. Porn will destroy your life. Porn will take away your ability to be normal around people. And you'll see people as sex objects. And your whole mind will get perverted. You won't even be able to be around people because your thoughts are so perverted from feeding your spirit and your mind pornography. If God tells you to uh, forgive, if you are holding on to unforgiveness, then there is a root of bitterness growing in your belly. That root of bitterness will eventually grow to the point where it suffocates your whole life, and you'll be so bitter you can't function. What do I mean by that? If you've been holding unforgiveness for years and you haven't forgiven, do you know what's going to happen long term? Long term, you're going to start snapping on people that didn't do anything to you. You might have experienced that with your parents. Sometimes you were just being a kid and your parents snapped, man. They went all the way off. That wasn't you. That's some unforgiveness that they're still carrying that has grown into a root a root of bitterness, and that's what unforgiveness does, man. It turns into these roots of bitterness. And then what ends up happening is you're on your job, trying to do your job, and somebody maybe drops something or somebody makes a joke, and it's not even that big of a deal. And you snap. And you go all off. In like 15 or 20 minutes, you go into this tirade. What they did was not proportional to your response. Do you know why you acted that way? Because you are carrying some unforgiveness down in your belly. Somebody did something to you, and you've been holding on to it. When God is calling you to unforgiveness, he is not calling you to say that what they did to you was okay. When God is calling you to unforgiveness, when God is calling you to forgiveness, he's trying to tell you that you don't have to stay in jail to what they did to you. See what I mean? So I'm just trying to give you some practical examples of how when God says, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. That's in our best interest to obey that. Okay? All right. That's the prophetic word for today. So I'm going to go to... All right. So I already had a couple of prayer requests. Uh, praise God for that. If you have any more prayer requests, please put them on the screen right now. When you see me close my eyes and I start speaking in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there anyone out there that needs physical healing? And is there anyone out there that need, uh, needs a demon cast out? And I, now I'm also asking him about finances. Okay? So that's what I'm about to go into now. Uh-huh. Okay, the Holy Ghost said, um, and I already had a prayer for it earlier, the Holy Ghost said there's, Something going on in somebody's abdomen, something in your stomach. 
Put your hand on your abdomen, on your stomach, and say, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing. I speak life and health. And also, the Spirit of God is saying that there's also unforgiveness. What I was just talking about, there's some unforgiveness that needs to come out. Okay? So a root of bitterness doesn't grow. So right now, in the name of Jesus, go before the Father. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, please forgive me for my sin. Please help me forgive whoever wronged me for their sin against me. And please forgive me for not receiving your forgiveness and not giving forgiveness. So give me forgiveness all the way around right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sometimes the for unforgiveness you're holding on to is anger against yourself. Sometimes we just need to forgive ourselves. Okay? Ooh, that's unusual. Okay. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost told me I need to rebuke the spirit of the lottery. So in the name of Jesus, you are a Christian. You ain't got no business playing the lottery. It's in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that gambling spirit. You're not supposed to be going to the casino or the riverboat or throwing your money away on a lottery. You're supposed to be paying tithes, offerings, and doing alms and letting the Lord guide your finances. So in the name of Jesus, I break off that spirit of lottery off your head, out your head, out your ear. To make you feel like you're going to get your financial breakthrough by playing a lottery. That's not for us to do as believers. Okay? We give tithes, offerings, and alms to God, and the Lord will give us increase. Okay? Okay. Okay. All right. So let me see if there's anything else the Holy Ghost wants to say. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with my connection, but you know, every time, every time, you know, something's happening, and there's some type of funniness. But I rebuke that in Jesus' name. And also, if you're on my Facebook and my uh, screen, your screen was freezing and the broadcast was freezing, uh, my Periscope was fine. So I'm going to put a link to the Periscope so you can watch the whole thing without interruption. And also, that's going to be on YouTube. Okay. All right. Well, bless God. Um, again, I gave you a lot of information, so I strongly, strongly encourage you to uh, watch this tape uh, more than once so you can get all the information so you can receive. Because remember, when a prophetic word goes forth, it's designed to change, to, to break chains, to release you, to let you free. Okay? All right. Praise God. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm here every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then, like I said, you can watch the replay on Periscope. Facebook, or YouTube, okay? And I'll be back in a couple of weeks in March for the next installment of my No More Genie series. I have to ask the Lord, does he want me to uh, continue to talk about marriage, or is there something else I need to address? So I'll let you know what that topic is going to be. Those of you that follow me personally on Facebook, you know I have a book launch coming up this Tuesday night at 8 p.m., a children's book that I'm releasing. I'm so excited about it. So, uh, so I got that going on as well. Uh, so, again, I thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for your support. God bless you. Have a great week. Remember that when God calls us out from a worldly lifestyle, it's not a punishment. It's a blessing. And everything about your life will be better when you live the way the Lord wants you to live because God is love and God loves you. All right? God bless. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Denise. Thank you. God bless, and I'll see you next time.